Um, welcome back from lunch um, and the very short break that we, um, that we had <laughs> today, sorry about that. Um, we're going to keep moving um, in part because one of our next speakers has to leave immediately after she's scheduled to fly off to Howard University for another water conference. So we're really delighted that she's squeezed us in um, to her schedule and we want to respect that and, and keep, keep ourselves on schedule um, today. So I'm really, really delighted to introduce our next um, speaker, um, Monica Lewis Patrick also known as the Water Warrior. Some of you have, may have heard about her. She is co-founder and current president of We the People of Detroit, a community coalition that has been working for a number of years now to conduct community-driven research on issues that are identified by the community um, in need of additional research evidence. Um, and the organization works to inform and empower the public on critical issues related to civil rights, land, water, um, and also the democratic process. Um, we are um, so delighted to have her here today. She's gonna be co-presenting with one of her colleagues, um, Nadia Gaber, a medical anthropologist who is also in training to become a allopathic doctor, yes. So Monica calls her doctor, doctor. Um, <laughs> Um, and she is a member of the we, um, the we the People of Detroit Community Research Collective. Um, we're, I think we're in, you guys are all in for a real treat um, as they talk. They're going to be talking about mapping the water crisis. So thanks, you guys. Thank you so much, Amy. And could we just give a round of applause to Amy and an amazing job that's been done? I can tell you last night uh, I left and I was, uh, it was really heartbreaking uh, to just hear what's happening in Oscoda. And is Tony in the room? About four years ago I had never heard of PFOS, never heard the phrase, uh, the terminology. And Tony and I were in a room at the All About Water Conference. And I was there mad as hell because they were shutting off water in Detroit. And Tony was telling me about what was happening to Oscoda, so then I got mad about Oscoda. So as we sit in that room for about a day and a half of conferences and workshops and lectures, there's a kinship that happened. And so I told Tony as we were leaving the conference, I said, I won't ever work on water and have an opportunity where I can't bring you to the table. I'll make sure every time that I can raise your name, I'll lift it. And one of the things that I can say about Tony Espinola, Espinola is that every time he's had that opportunity, he's done the same thing for me. So one of the things I want to help you sort of come into the space with, and I've heard the theme throughout the day, especially from the last panel, is that community is the expert. Community is the expert. That's my friend. I know him as Tony the Tiger, so I, I you know. <laughs> but one of the things that we found out uh, very quickly is that people ignore community. They treat us as though you're a casualty of a war. And one of the things that we found out in Detroit, because our organization is young, I'm old, but the organization's young. The organization is 10 years old, it's only been a nonprofit for about five years, but the work that we've done has been monumental. But in 2014, when an amazing activist by the name of Charity Hicks began to tell us that we were going to experience the shutting off of water to the magnitude that had never been seen in American history. And we thought, okay, charity's brilliant. Maybe it's just one of those moments where we just don't get it. But then as days and months and weeks went on, what we found is that charity had set off an alarm and that what we were in the middle of was a water war. So what we saw happen is as there had been a master narrative all across Michigan, that shutting off water was because black folks didn't pay their bills. Irresponsible leadership, not knowing how to lead yourself, not prepared to govern. Some of the same things I heard this morning. But the other thing that we knew is that people were getting sicker and sicker. What we also knew is that people were losing their children. And so when we got a call saying that Charity Hicks had been arrested for just trying to let her neighbors know that they had been shut off from water. 
Then I've got a grandmother that's Southern, and you may not know this phrase from the North. She told me, she said, things like that stick in my craw. Well, that's what it did for me. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat. Just the thought that one of her neighbors had just had a baby that was premature, and that woman was in threat of losing that premature baby because she didn't have running water in her house. That became personal. So as we begin to look at what was happening around water shutoffs, one was how do we answer the question that every human life should have a pathway to clean, safe, and affordable water? Because somebody had decided that poor folks and black folks didn't deserve that same right. How do we evidence to people the imbalance and the inequity and the injustice of denying people access to clean, safe, affordable water. Well, what I know is that sometimes when they won't believe the activists, they might believe the academics. So there were people like Dr. Nadia Gaber and Professor Emily Kudel, who is an architect and a designer. She's right now doing a fellowship at the University of Buffalo. They came into the community just to help us deliver water because we were told at that time we would only need to deliver water for about three weeks that there's no way that our government would not respond to our crisis. Well, that three weeks has now turned into six years. We deliver about 150 to 200 tons of water a year. We not only deliver water in Detroit, but we deliver water in Flint. Because see, before Flint became a buzzword for many of you, we were working in Flint two years before most people would even admit that this crisis had occurred. We have been delivering water in Flint now for three years. And we're still delivering water because of failed leadership by government, by mental health and public health workers, by persons that were supposed to ensure that what's coming out of your tap is clean and safe. They failed. And so even to this day, people are purchasing bottled water in place of water running out of their tap because they don't trust it. But at the same time, we are supporting the commodification of bottled water, which is lending itself to the privatization of water. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't to me. So I'm just a country girl. This is not my vocation. I didn't choose water. Water chose me. And so what I know, because my name is Monica Lewis Patrick, Lewis means warrior, when I find a good fight, I get in it. So we started something called the We the People of Detroit Community Research Collective. And two things happened. One, we had found out in Michigan under emergency management that if we partnered with a university, that Governor Snyder could use his powers to actually commandeer our data. So we built a table of researchers, and now we have 67 researchers from all across the country that convene with We the People of Detroit on specific issues that need to be answered with an academic and scientific lens. And so this is why the table has been created. But guess who runs the table? Not academics, the community, the people. And one of the things I want to say as we're moving to the next slide is that when we were in the middle and continue to be in the middle of this health crisis, we could not get one health director or school of public health to respond to the fact that it is an egregious act to deny people access to water, and that there is a public health impact when people don't have access to water. But didn't you think it was interesting that not one university, not one academic in the state of Michigan would speak up for Detroit? And so students, your students here at the University of Michigan, decided that it was egregious. And so they began to go to their professors as they were coming and volunteering, delivering water with us, and said, I don't know if I want to go to a school that has the only school of public health in the state of Michigan, but will not speak to water shutoffs. It also has been on these grounds that your students, over 3,000 of them, organized themselves to talk about health impacts connected to fossil fuels, connected to water shutoffs. So even sometimes when we as adults have not gotten it, our babies have gotten it. And so thank God for the students of the University of Michigan, because they stood when the, when the academic and the universities did not. So one of the things I want to tell you just off the rip, and I know we're at U of M, but I'm going to give some credit to Michigan State. Dr. Elizabeth Mack said, yeah, go green. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Mack said 
that you know, we're right now sitting in about 11.9% of the American population cannot afford their water. This research was done about three years ago. We are on pace in the next two years where about 35.6% of the nation will not be able to afford their water. So this is not just black folks and people in Detroit, but this is people all across the country. The next one, please. After that one, please. The other thing I need you to know is that this is not divided along uh, uh, political lines. What we have found all across this country, if you look at places like Chicago, Chicago's water rates have tripled in the last eight years. Toledo's water rates have doubled in the last few months. What you're finding in Detroit is water rates have gone up over 120% in the last 12 years. So for communities that you have seen the population dwindle, for communities where you have seen the tax base dwindle, this is not the people's fault, but it better be the people's fight. And so what we came together, and this is Dr. D uh, Gloria House. Uh, she actually is retired from this institution. And one of the things that she told us, she said, nobody's coming to save us. Nobody's coming to save us. And she encouraged us along with the Honorable Councilwoman Joanne Watson as black women. She said, we're the mothers of all civilization. And we have to love all of our children enough to tell the truth. She says, so what I'm going to tell all of y'all to do is all of you have been to the institutions and the academy. You all have advanced degrees, which we all do in some area. She says, so convene yourselves. And so this is how the collective started. And so the first question that the community had is, are water shutoffs really happening? Now, mind you, this research is only a, a small segment of the research because we had to sue the city of Detroit eight times to get even this information. Now, this is data that used to be readily available and mailed to your houses. Now, wonder what has changed. We're more computerized, more digitized, but you can't give me the same information that you used to mail to my home about how many people have been shut off from water? And so if you look at this map, if you know anything about Detroit, you'll know that the lower half is riverfront property, is downtown. The middle is actually two other small cities, Highland Park and Hamtramck, but the rest of it is the city of Detroit. Now, they would lead you to believe that it's just poor folks. But guess what? East English Village is one of the most affluent communities. 30% of that population within that particular neighborhood cannot sustain their water access. So does it sound like poor people not wanting to pay their bills? Or does it sound like that there is a systemic issue that is causing people to not be able to afford their bills? The next one, please. The other thing that we wanted to remind people as we were under this contrived bankruptcy that was actually deconstructing our water department, we wanted to remind Michiganders who built it, who paid for it. And so what you're seeing here is that you're seeing the massiveness of that water system. One of the things I'll say, and I'll just tell you the truth, Flint got poisoned in their haste to steal Detroit's water system. That's how Flint got poisoned. They were in a rush to be able to push through the bankruptcy, the regionalization of a water system, and they didn't want to pay fair market value for it. So this is how you got here. So now what you have is in the deep turquoise, that's the city of Detroit. But this system runs all the way up to the top of the T, which is Flint. We provide water to 126 municipalities and townships. 40% of the state of Michigan gets their water from a well that the residents of Detroit built. But in 1955, the, the water department director at that time said that if we are forced to build this system out to the suburbs, that the city of Detroit will go bankrupt. But we were legislated to do so because we were the only city with the bonding capacity to actually build the infrastructure. We had no idea that we were actually cutting off our nose to spite our face that we were headed down a pathway where the actual rate payers were going to be paying uh, wholesale and the owners would be paying retail. So we put together this and it was critical for us to be able to demonstrate and visualize as much as we could because there has been a very uh, divisive kind of approach to how people talk about Detroit versus everybody else, Detroit and the rest of the state. And so one of the things we wanted to demonstrate is just the discrepancies in terms of the wholesale rates versus retail. That deep turquoise blue is what Detroit sells the water to the municipalities at that level. Where you see the black marking is the markups. Those municipalities and townships are marking their water up anywhere from 100 to 1,000 percent. 
But guess what the narrative is? Well, we're paying for Detroit's bankruptcy. We're paying for failed leadership. And guess what that does? This is some of the conversation that Tony and I had. If we don't put the facts on the table, and if we don't have a conversation where we're bringing people together, then it becomes very easy for other people on the other side of the state to just decide to wash their hands of us and to continue to support policies that are bad for us. But if we get in rooms like this and begin to deputize ourselves to understand that it's only as Michiganders operating in concert and consensus that we're going to be able to build a better Michigan where water is accessible to all. Can you go to the next one just on housing? Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump off and uh, hand the mic to, to Nadia because I want her to be able to, uh, to share with you some of the health study work we've done. But I just think it's important that you see these two uh, slides here. One, we had our young people, and one of the things they wanted to demonstrate is not only what had happened in terms of the height of the water shutoffs in the city of Detroit, but they wanted to show the parallels between what was happening in Flint at the same time. But then what I thought was so magical, because sometimes we get so stuck in the trauma and the fight, that the young people were able to see where we were winning, where our work and coordination of work was making impact. And so where you see them begin to step back as we stood up was in moments where the city council and Kevin Orr came. Well, community showed up and resisted that. So what did they do? They began to soften. They began to put a moratorium on shutting off water. Of course, as Kevin Orr got closer to the bankruptcy, he ramped up shutting off water again. But then what happened is that the organizations and the community got together and then they brought in uh, they brought in activists from across the country. They brought in the National Nurses Union. Netroots got involved. And so what you saw is the momentum begin to shift around the conversation. So the conversation didn't stay at, oh, poor black folks don't want to pay their bills. Then as more and more evidence came to the forefront, they had to shift. So then the conversation began around, okay, we can't give you affordability, but we'll give you assistance. Well, what we know is assistance is charity. It says, if I want to help you, I will. And if I have a few dollars, I'll give it to you. But what affordability says is I will create a sustained pathway to ensure that you have access to water. That's totally different. And then this is the last one that I'll end with before we go to uh, Dr. G Gaber, is that this is the one that brings tears to my eyes. Because when you think about the fact that one of the things that we were sold uh, during the great heightened level of the auto industry was that you could get a chicken in every pot, that as long as you worked hard, you'd be able to send your children to college, you'd be able to meet your mortgage and pay for your house and your health care. Well, my grandparents moved to Detroit in 1952. My, grandfa my great grandfather is the father of Willie Horton, the baseball player. And one of the things we took a lot of pride in coming to Detroit in those summers, 13 grandkids packed into a Chevy station wagon, was that coming to Detroit was really where our family was able to get a leg up. They were able to work in the auto industry coming out of the coal mines of Virginia. And so my grandfather in 52, with having 18 children, never thought he would own a home. So for him, later on in 67, to buy a home was like he had hit the lottery. To then turn around and see that in 2014, you saw over 15,000 homeowners forced into foreclosure just on water debt. They didn't owe property taxes, but they couldn't afford their water because they were on a fixed income. And so when I look at this and you look at it and you compare it to the first map that we showed you about water shutoffs, do you see correlation? Do you see correlation? You visually see correlation. And so one of the things that I want to just remind you is that it's not just about one thing. It's about everything. That this has been essential in terms of displacing black families, that it has been critical in terms of shutting down schools, it has been a component of putting a division in our community where there are two Detroits, there's downtown and midtown, and then there's the rest of everybody that's around town. 
And so this is some of the folks that came together. Nadia uh, actually led a team of researchers. Over 40 researchers came together to do the mapping, the water crisis book, to put digital evidence to what we already knew was happening. Well, that is an impossible act to follow, but I do want to thank Monica for inviting me and passing the mic along. Um, it's really just been part of the practice and part of what I've learned through doing this type of work um, is how important it is um, to build these partnerships um, in a community research collective that have also really um, um, just strengthened each of us and bringing our collective talents to the table. So what are group has been doing is bringing together, as I said, activists, academics, researchers, designers, to try to draw on the expertise that we learn when we um, are in school or in the academy or in, in institutions like this. And I was a graduate student when we did this work. Um, but also to make sure that we draw on the expertise of people with lived experience, um, who are really the best able to pose questions that we should be investigating. Um, and for whom the data is created with in this model and um, belongs to. So that was always really important in us designing and setting up these studies. And we realized, um, you know, I didn't personally come to do public health research, I'm an anthropologist, um, but in writing about the cultural, social, and political changes that have created these conditions, it is really hard to not have any preliminary data to not be able to have a baseline picture of what's going on. And when I got here, it became really clear nobody was doing that research. Nobody was following up. And we realized very quickly, if we didn't organize to do something and figure out what tools were at hand, train ourselves, go out there and do the work, it wasn't going to happen. So this is one study that we did in partnership um, with Henry Ford Health System, some investigators there. Um, who were able to get um, internal data from their hospital records and look at folks who had come in because they had been diagnosed with a water-related illness. Um, and we were able to take that data, which Monica mentioned, was gotten through years of lawsuits and FOIA requests um, from the city of Detroit, and map out, um, this is a, on the right, what we showed you earlier, where those shutoffs were happening, control for what's called the social vulnerability index, where we talk about poverty, access to housing, health care, and transportation, um, and, and then see if there's a specific correlation between the geographic areas where shutoffs were happening and the incidence of water-related health, water -related health issues um, that were seen at Healthy For Henry Ford. And they did find that people who had been diagnosed with these skin and soft tissue diseases that were water related were one and a half times more likely to live on a block in a neighborhood that was shut off. And it, that same effect went the other direction. So that living on a block with water shutoffs increases your likelihood of getting diagnosed with one of these illnesses. And why that's important is it also means it doesn't matter if you yourself lose water. I mean, it does matter, but it's not only the people who are shut off, it's the people around you. These diseases we know from the founding of public health itself spread, they're communicable. Um, and we were able to show that these um, have more impacts among those who are the most socially vulnerable. This is another study that we didn't do, but I just wanted to put out there because of that work with Henry Ford, um, someone who was formerly with um, the Michigan Community Health um, looked through their records and found double in one case, triple these rates of Campylobacter, Shigellosis, Giardia, diseases that are not very prevalent um, in the United States, commonly thought of as traveler's illnesses, um, happening with their epicenter in Detroit at this time. So Monica mentioned what we did was we looked to the toolkits that we had at hand. What could we do ourselves? And we found this. Um, toolkit that the CDC puts out, it's called the CASPER, and it's designed to be used after disasters to do rapid and reliable public health needs assessment. Um, and it kind of lays out a sampling method that you know can be both random and representative of a city. Um, and it's this two-stage cluster sampling method, so where you kind of use census data to pick out, we had 30 different clusters all over the city of Detroit. Then. Um, the second phase, we engaged all of our community members at this um, training to um, make sure that we were sampling every 
um, nth house, depending on the number. So we were kind of teaching different survey practices and methods. We were doing it together, and then we were going out in teams um, to talk to folks. And you know, with our survey, um, this was, again, a citywide assessment, because we knew that um, the first thing that people might say is, well, you just picked the few people that you knew, and you talked to them. So we wanted to make sure we had representative data. And at the time of contact, so this is any given day someone knocks on your door, 5% of people whose doors we knocked on um, were without water when we, um, when we met them. And we were able to connect all of them to the water rights hotline, which is another part of the practice of doing community-based, community-led research, which I'll come back to. 17% of households were at that time or had been shut off from water. More than a quarter were at risk of being shut off. They had active notices that they were at risk of shut off. And the average length of time that the people stayed in their homes without water was 10 and a half days. This, I think, was really important because at the time the city was saying it's an average of 24 hours and people get their service reconnected. That was clearly not true. Um, and this doesn't even count um, all the people who moved or they went and stayed at their sister's house or, you know, they got out of town for a while, they stayed in a hotel. So these are people who are just living in their house and making do with bottled water. I'm getting the note to wrap up, so I'm going to move along quickly. Um, Authority Health put out this recommendation that the following groups of people should be protected based on their health vulnerability from being shut off. So when we went and we said, well, how many houses did have infants and children under 18? More than 50%. How many people had um, elders in the home, people with disabilities, people in, with critical medical needs? Um, so 82% of the households that we surveyed would have been protected under the moratorium that Authority Health proposed to the city of Detroit had it been respected. We did a second survey, I'll just say really quickly, where we dug down deep and then we wanted to say, okay, how can we look at the psychosocial impacts of not having water? So we um, did a two-part study. Again, I think the method is important. So we drew on the experience that we, the people, had delivering water for years, working with community members to create a survey that talked about how do your practices actually change? What do you do when you feel like you're at risk of shutoff? Um, and then used this um, standard um, psychosocial distress scale from Harvard, and we were able to create something that was ethnographically grounded in local experience, but then also had a metric where we could compare it to a valid instrument of measuring mental distress. And we found a statistically significant and a substantial relationship. Um, that's that table on the right. And we also found significant changes in the safety-related behaviors and the water stress of people who both have had their water shut off and people who just fear that they're at risk and have a lot of financial stress. So, you know, we continue to call for an immediate moratorium on all water shutoffs and, like Monica mentioned, an affordability plan that's um, based on household income and doesn't rely on um, assistance programs. And we also, um, you know, whenever we do this, we report this data back to community first because we respect that it was built with them and belongs to them. And we also want to give people information about what can we do to protect ourselves and also if your water is off, how you can call the water rights hotline and get immediate emergency assistance. So I'm going to hand it back to Monica, I think, for question and answer. And after the water shutoffs, we saw that a lot of people could not afford their water bills because the water company, through city council, was consenting to adding extra penalties and fees and drainage fees and non-pervious uses on families that were already stressed. And uh, it seems like the people that are already stressed were also put under more pressure, as you said, with the home foreclosures uh, due to the tax bills. Um, has the city been open to talk or the water uh, 
Great Lakes Water Authority been open to talk to you guys about relieving some of that, that stress with these added uh, penalties and fees and, and taxations, as far as I call them, uh, drainage fees. Because if it's a tax, it has to go through and be approved through legislation with our city council. I think what has happened is that, uh, that they have been exposed for the, uh, for the misleading information that they've provided to the public. And I think in that exposure, what has happened is research like what we just demonstrated, where we have traveled all around the country and around the globe, actually helping people connect the dots, it's really exposed them. And so I think what you have now is because there's no way that you can run uh, from the data. You cannot run from the research. And so uh, my organization, We the People of Detroit, has spent thousands of dollars sending me places that will cost thousands of dollars to be able to shed a light because Mr. Brown and the Water Department, DWSD and GLEWA, has spent a lot of money PRing this issue. And the money they spent creating PR, they really could have turned the water on. What we know in Detroit, it takes a million dollars to help a thousand families. So if you have tens of thousands of families shut off from water, then you tell me how far is 2.5 million going to go? And now Mr. Brown, of course, is touting that he is out there fighting for more money. Well, what we know is before you took over the water department, there was an allocation of $5 million to help families that couldn't afford water. So whoever negotiated the Great Lakes water deal didn't have Detroiters in mind. And the thing I'm going to say to all of these folks in this room about water, too, is that when we know that we need almost $6 trillion to address our water infrastructure, and Congress has only allocated $1.74 then that should tell everybody in this room they've already started deciding who's going to drink and who will not. We better decide in this room that everybody has a right to water, and then we can figure out the path to get them there. So um, my question is, is related to what Teresa was saying. So a couple of years back, the city started charging folks for this, dra this drainage fee. So it's not just the water. Now you're paying for the rain. Literally, depending on how much impermeable imper surface you have, your roof, sidewalk, driveway, whatever. And recently, I've seen that pe even people who have their water shut off have been getting a bill for drainage. So what, if they don't pay that, I don't, I mean, their water's already shut off. What's going to happen to the people who, who are getting this bill for drainage? Well, the drainage bill is going to drive poor people deeper into debt. Uh, because what it is is now they have changed the process to where the bills were attached to the property. The bills are now attached to the person. So now what they do is they make you, as you're entering to a payment plan or you're trying to get a bill in your name, you must provide your Social Security number so that that bill will follow you everywhere you go. So you've had people come into the city actually trying to buy homes from the land bank where there has been a $20,000, $40,000 uh, bill attached to that property. And so those persons thinking that they're buying into the American dream, getting a home for $1,000 or two or three, then find out after they purchase it that they now have been indebted to $20,000 and $30,000 and $40,000 of unpaid water bills. So what this is doing is it's actually... Uh, my mother told me something in uh, 2014. She's a retired master sergeant from the U.S. Army. Uh, she's a retired nurse from the VA. And she told me, she's a combat veteran. She's still at 75 years old, can be called up by her government because she has a unique skill of setting up a surgical unit in a war zone. And she told me in 2014, this is a no-nonsense lady. Like, I cut up. She doesn't. She said that, <laughs> she said that shutting, off war, uh, shutting off water is an act of war. And then she quoted the Geneva Convention. And she told me then, she said, you can't shut off your enemy in times of war. So you decide now. And she, she was talking to me really straight. She said, you're my daughter, so I want you to know you got to either die on your feet or on your knees. She said, but you have entered into a war, and they will kill you about this water. And so I, I live my life understanding that I am risking everything because I don't want to believe that there will come a time when my children's children's children won't be able to drink. So those are the things that get me up at night, that wake me up in the morning. Yesterday morning, we had a family of 16 living in a flat with no water and sanitation. We have data 
at the national level that says that southeastern Michigan sits in the largest hepatitis A outbreak in American history. But at the same time, you had the state government of Michigan telling us that it was intravenous drug use and same-sex partners when we know that the science says that the biggest driver of hepatitis A is the inability to wash your hands and have proper sanitation. And so I tell my grandchildren all the time, my daughter tells me, she said, Mama, you've traumatized the babies about this water. <laughs> but I tell them all the time, if you don't remember anything else about your grandmother, I want you to know that I deputize myself to dedicate my life, not just for black babies and brown babies, but for every human being on the planet to have access to water. Because what we found out very quickly in Detroit is that it was very easy for people to dismiss us as black and brown and poor folks. But then when we united our fight and our struggle with families, the Navajo Nation, you've got women that have been trucking in water for over a decade. When we connected that struggle to families in Puerto Rico, that have been dealing with the fallout of our war games in their backyard for decades. When we connected it to what was happening in, in Zimbabwe and all around the globe, in Ireland where they're metering their water and the people are rising up, is what we know is water is the one thing that will unite us. Everything else is dividing us. But if we can't figure out, none of you can make it without this life-sustaining source. And my grandmother used to tell us when we would fight as kids, she said, get in the room. And I don't care what you do, but you can't come out till you work it out. So I'm hoping today was one of those get in the rooms. And I'm hoping Amy doesn't let you out till you work it out. I'm going to take that as a call to move as a call to movement. Um, we knew what we were doing when we put Monica in this place in the lineup. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Nadia, for coming with us. Okay, everybody take a deep breath. We are getting ready to move to the next uh, portion of the day. And um, this is um, moving us to the breakout groups where we are gonna get to have a conversation amongst ourselves about topics that we're passionate about. We've identified f uh, five topics up front that we are hoping there will be interest in having some conversation about. They're in your programs. You're about to hear from um, representatives in the room about what topics are going to be talked about within those. We also gave folks the opportunity over the course of the day to identify additional topics. We've got a couple that have been identified. Um, and so what we are going to do now is we're going to hear five, what we're calling fast food for thought. We, we unabashedly lifted that title from the um, Sustainable Food Systems Initiative here in the school um, or in the university. Um, but really, um, the idea of these fast food for thoughts is to give you a sense very quickly of what the topics are that are going to be covered in the breakout rooms. And then we are going to move. And we're going to move to um, rooms on the, up, the next floor up, the third floor. And we're going to spend the next hour and a half or so in dialogue. So I'm going to invite the folks who are doing the fast food for thoughts to come up to the room. While they are moving, please join me in thanking once again uh, Monica Lewis. Thank you.